Writing novels takes me to the oddest places. And if I'm going single-handed, I like to travel light. I can take care of almost everything I need with this. The American Express card. Apply for it today. It uh, carries a lot of weight. Hi, sir. The rest is my luggage. Just a short visit, is it, sir? No, uh, rather. Don't leave home without it. Thanks to their own ITN news team, Oracle's view of the world is always up to date. The world of finance is no exception. Everything from interest rates to exchange rates at the push of a button. There's interest for the kids too, jokes, letters, and the latest pop news. While winning a prize only costs a phone call on the dial-in quiz. And when you hard-working women have earned a rest, there's Home File, complete with lists of special prices from the major supermarkets. Whenever you want full value from your TV, page your Oracle. Tonight at 10.30, a sense of the past with Graham Garden looks at the architecture of the Midland Railway Company. And then after that... Tonight at 11, Kojak investigates a shooting. If this guy croaks, I'm going to take your license, put it into the coffin, and whoop, down to the grave, six feet under, baby. Crocker, him and Benny grew up together. Tight friends. And what's Benny? Just a other working stiff, trying to hustle an honest buck. According to you, then, he's the salt of the earth. You think I'm going to let you walk out on this? There's nothing wrong with you, buster. Hey, Captain, you're going to turn out to be the jerk of the year. Trouble from every angle for Kojak. Tonight at 11 on Thames. And that's followed by a profile of one of America's most famous cinema families, the Fonders in That's Hollywood, tonight at 12 o'clock. <laughs> This is Thames from London. The time is now 10 o'clock. At the studios of the ITN, Alistair Burnett and Sandy Gall. In the Gulf War, an Iranian airliner is shot down. The Soviet space station on the route to Mars. Mr. Tebbit finds the opposition cheap and nasty. Grenada's conqueror gets a hero's welcome. And the Queen has a day with her Gurkha heroes. Good evening. Iran accused Iraq today of shooting down a civilian airliner 50 miles inside Iran's borders. It says more than 40 on board were killed, including several members of the Iranian parliament and a close aide of Ayatollah Khomeini, his representative in the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. Iraq said it was sheer lies to say it would attack civilian aircraft. According to the Iranian news agency, the plane, a Fokker friendship, was approaching Avaz from Tehran when it was shot and blown up in the sky by Iraqi jets. The war on the ground is being fought in southern Iraq. The Iranians took the old refinery town of Four early last week, and they've advanced about eight miles up the west bank of the Shat al-Arab waterway. But the Iraqis are counter-attacking and using mustard gas, according to Iran. Some Iranian casualties were flown to London tonight for treatment. By flying close to the battle zone, the Iranian airliner today could have been mistaken as a legitimate target, particularly as it's reported that Iran has used Fokker friendships as military transport. There have been relentless air attacks this week, Iraqi planes striking repeatedly at positions once theirs, but now held by invading and jubilant soldiers of Ayatollah Khomeini's Islamic army. The Iranians say they've shot down 45 Iraqi planes, but if an Iranian civilian flight has been attacked, it'll be seen as a new atrocity, even by Gulf War standards. It does appear that the Iraqis have air supremacy, as a group of visiting Western journalists found to their cost. A German reporter died from heart failure during this strike. As the Iranian front line presses closer to Basra, Iraq's second largest city, the fighting is bound to intensify in casualties and the inhumanity inflicted on each other. In their massive counter-attack, the Iraqis are again waging chemical warfare, desperate to regain the upper hand, whatever the cost, in suffering or world opinion. It's now the Iranians who seem to have gained on the ground, despite the confidence shown by these Iraqi troops on pictures from Baghdad. But in human terms, with tens of thousands of bodies littering the battlefield, both sides are the losers. And in Europe, the propaganda war has resumed, with plane loads of blistered and tormented Iranian soldiers victims of chemical weapons being flown very publicly to Vienna, Stockholm and Britain, 
not only for specialist treatment, but for all to see. The Soviet Union has successfully launched a new space laboratory into orbit. It's designed to form the heart of the world's first permanently manned station. Space experts expect it to link up with the Salyut 7 station launched in 1982, ready for cosmonauts to go on board, probably within the next few weeks. A proton rocket smoothly lifted the unmanned space station into orbit just after midnight Moscow time. Observers believe the space station, called Mir, Russian for peace, weighs 35 tons, the heaviest load Proton can carry. It's a significant step forward in the Soviet space program. About the same size as the existing Salyut space station, but much better equipped. It even has an armchair. It also has six docking ports where other spacecraft can be attached to build a home from home for Soviet cosmonauts. This is the beginning of the permanently manned space station. This new module which has gone has six docking ports and they will be able to build on from the sides and onto the end and have a facility where cosmonauts can live in relative comfort compared with Salyut and do space processing and make observations of the Earth. The Soviets probably intend to link the new space station with the Salyut already in orbit and then send up at least three cosmonauts. And in two months, the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's first space flight, this is the monument to him in Moscow, Mir could well be involved in a celebratory space spectacular. The Soviet success with space stations like this Salyut and now with Mir only goes to show that they're years ahead of the Americans who last launched a free-flying space station 13 years ago. The Soviet Union's experiments with Earth-orbiting vehicles are only a part of a much bigger plan. They're testing components for the most powerful rocket ever to be built and are preparing to use this to send men to Mars. The Americans expect them to do this in about seven years' time. The United States won't be ready to go to Mars before the turn of the century, at least seven years behind the Russians, and the shuttle disaster has put them still further behind. ITN has details of the direction in which the Russians are expected to go and of a revolutionary proposal the Americans are studying. Tonight and tomorrow we have two exclusive reports by ITN's space unit. First, the Russian plans. Even with today's sophisticated space technology, the Soviets will need the new giant rocket to get to Mars. Manned missions to the planets need much more powerful rockets than other space shots. They have to carry life support systems and enough fuel to get them there and back again. To get to the moon, the Americans had to build Saturn, the biggest rocket ever used. At that time, in the 60s, the Soviets were also trying for the moon and built a similar rocket, known as the G-Vehicle. The trouble is, theirs didn't work. One exploded on the launch pad, two others blew up soon after liftoff. But now they have a new version. The rocket, which has been seen by spy satellites, is 100 metres tall and several test launches are expected this year. The American Department of Defence and our own MOD call it the heavy lift vehicle. The huge rocket comprises a central core filled with 1,000 tonnes of fuel and fitted with four engines. The core is surrounded by four strap-on boosters. This number can be increased to six or eight boosters to give it enormous thrust. With all eight strap-ons, it could lift 280 tonnes. Compare that to the shuttle's 30 or Ariane's 5 tonnes. If nothing else, the Russians think big. They also plan well in advance. The rest of the hardware they need to get to Mars has been ready and regularly flown for the past 15 to 20 years. While the Americans scrapped everything from their moon programme, the Soviet Union didn't. They held on to many parts, adapting them for other uses. For example, the upper stages of the proton rocket were part of their original effort to get to the moon. Over the past 20 years, they've been used to put up satellites. And they kept their original moon lander. It became the Soyuz craft that now ferries cosmonauts to and from the Salyut space station. It still retains most of its original interior design for use on the moon, with a horizontal couch and table worktop, and a hatch positioned so men could climb out and descend to the moon's surface. Modified, this will become the Mars lander. The Salyut space station itself, in which men have learned to live for long periods, long enough to travel to Mars, has been part of their preparation to go there. So the Soviet Union will go to Mars in much the same way they planned to go to the moon 20 years ago. But this time they'll need a modified Salyut for the expected three-man crew to live in for the two-and-a-half-year journey. While it would need only one giant rocket to go direct to the moon, they will need four to mount a Mars mission. Not all of them will go to Mars. They'll be used to assemble what amounts to two complete rockets, fully fueled in Earth orbit. 
First, they'll put up the Mars lander, unmanned but with fully fueled rocket stages attached, to use when it reaches Mars. Next, they'll put up what is essentially a fully fueled 280 ton rocket. These two units will be linked together in Earth orbit and then fired on a course towards Mars. Once the landing vehicle is on the way, a second Mars rocket will be assembled to take the crew. The Salyut, empty but with fully fueled rocket stages attached, will be launched. And then the fourth and final booster will take up another of the 280 ton rockets. With these linked, the three cosmonauts will be ferried to the Salyut. Then they'll fire the 280 ton rocket to free them from Earth orbit and start the 300 million mile journey to Mars, which they'll reach some nine months later. There they'll dock with the unmanned landing craft that was sent off several weeks before them and two of the three cosmonauts will transfer to it. The lander with two cosmonauts inside it will then break away to make the descent to the surface of Mars using a saucer-shaped aerodynamic brake to slow them as they reach the Martian atmosphere. Parachutes will help them during the descent. Then retro rockets will fire when the craft is a few feet from the surface to give it a soft landing. It's not known how long they'll stay on the first mission. It's doubtful it will be less than a month. The Soviets have already stated publicly that their eventual goal is a permanent base on Mars. At the end of their stay, the lander will take off to rendezvous and dock with the mothership that's been orbiting with one man on board. The crew will transfer back to the Salyut. The lander will be jettisoned and the main rocket again fired to put them on a course for home another nine month stretch. When they're one hour from Earth, the crew will transfer to an Earth return capsule, detach themselves from their spacecraft and come in, slowing the capsule by skipping on the atmosphere 60 miles above the Earth, like the Apollo astronauts did coming back from the moon. Then below them, the welcome view of Kazakhstan as they slow their form with parachutes and in the last few seconds by a burst of their retro rockets, just as cosmonauts have done so many times over the years.